Welcome to the Cosmic Shambles Network. In this series, we're at Bordeaux in France, and we're here to join in with the ESA's 70-second parabolic flight campaign. So these are flights that get you into microgravity and certainly get the scientists around here into microgravity. In this video, we're going to be looking at the experiments to do with heat transfer. Now, that may not sound very interesting by itself, but just think about how uncomfortable you get if you're just a couple of degrees too hot or too cold. And we're in a nice protective environment here on Earth. Moving heat around is much more difficult when you're outside the atmosphere and it gets a lot hotter and a lot colder in space. So the experiments here are critical, important enough that they are going to fly in microgravity and we're going to watch them. Part of ESA's parabolic flight campaign is a recurring programme known as Fly Your Thesis. This programme offers students the opportunity to work alongside leading researchers and to fly their experiments in microgravity aboard Novaspace's zero-g aircraft. Selection is highly competitive, with a huge number of entries, and two teams flew as part of this 70-second campaign. I already looked at the grain power 3D printing experiments in a previous episode, and in this episode, Helen caught up with the PHP Cubed team from Brighton University and their pulsating heat pipe experiment. <laughs> the experiment just behind me is one of the Fly Your Thesis experiments. This is PHP Cubed and uh, they brought a very academic teddy with them as well. I approve of all the soft toys on this flight. Um, so they're testing heat, heat exchangers for space. <laughs> and their ability to sit down. <laughs> so uh, our team, we are currently making, well we've designed and we've built a, something called a pulsating heat pipe. Mm -hmm. So it's a passive cooling solution mm -hmm. for, uh, you can use it for a lot of different applications, but we've decided to go for the aspect of small scale satellites such as CubeSats. Now, keep just say a little bit in there about why cooling is important because down yep. here on Earth, like I spend a lot of my time being too cold. I don't want to know about cooling, right? So, yep. <laughs> but up in space, it's a different game. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's very different, and it's what we found from our research and experience is that a lot of satellites they have a lot of high-powered devices in nowadays. You know, cameras, CPUs. You know, and the problem is, is that. When they're, heat, when they're running, they generate a lot of heat mm -hmm. and it really reduces their life life's time. So what we're doing is we're trying to take the heat away from that and actually disperse it somewhere else that's not going to damage the actual electronics on board the satellite. Because uh, it's a big issue now. Uh, most satellites only have a couple of years, um, well, the smaller satellites only have a couple of years lifetime and that then becomes space junk when it's in orbit, which of course we don't really want. So. And the problem comes about because all the things that we take for granted when it comes to cooling on Earth just don't work. So, you know, if, if we have a cup of tea, someone wants to cool their cup of tea, they might blow on it, right? They might, there's yep. airflow that helps take heat away. If you put something on a metal surface, that will take heat away. Yep. And that doesn't work. There's no, um, there's no uh, atmosphere to try and radiate away the heat that way. So uh, there's no convection cooling. So we have to try and move it away and then uh, radiate the heat elsewhere in a different manner. We are concentrating more on, rather than getting the heat out of the satellite itself, mm -hmm. our, our system moves the heat. So it doesn't cool the system down in terms of gets out the satellite. Mm -hmm. That can be done by another aspect of the satellite. Mm -hmm. But this takes it away and moves it to an area that maybe could be de de you know, designated to be a cooling area. So you take it away from the critical point and then it becomes a problem of another system. Yeah. So what is, tell me about your uh, pulsating heat pipe then, what exactly does one of those do? Uh, we have our setup so it has uh, multiple loop configuration so that means we just got literally we go like this and we end up with a loop system like this. So these are pipes? Yep so these are all pipes and then these are all connected to one another like that and this is a fairly basic drawing of what we have. So it's a single loop and things can... Yep, so, so something it's inside the pipes can go all the way around the loop. Yep, so it's a, a special fluid that is designed for the pipe that we're using. Uh, and that's more based on the physics behind it. And where are the hot and cold things in this configuration? So in this configuration, we want to heat this end of the pipe mm -hmm. and cool this end of the pipe. Now we can, in our system, we actually have this looped over like that, but I've just kind of drawn it simply. Yeah. Uh, so we actually heat this area here, yep. and then we cool this area up here. Yep. 
And then in the center, uh, ideally, it's a, we don't touch it at all. It's the, more of a vacuum, so it's, not, it's supposed to remain like at a constant temperature. So it's supposed to equalize the temperature between the, the heated area and the cooling area. So the game we've got here is that we want to move heat from, from here to here. Was that that way around? Yep. Yeah. And so heat isn't something you can just pick up and move. No. But fluid, you can move around. Yeah. So the game is that if you can get the heat into the fluid, the fluid is like a little vehicle that transports it and then dumps it somewhere else. So the fluid is just your railway line yep. that takes heat from here to here. So why, w what's the pulsating bit in all of this? So the pulsations really all come from the actual fluid itself. And uh, it, it works by, if we heat this end here, then it evaporates, the fluid evaporates. And as this fluid starts to evaporate, it starts <laughs> to move towards the cold end. And then it will start to condense up in the colder end. Now, with our system, uh, we have designed it so that the, the, the basically the internal diameter of the pipe itself, mm -hmm. uh, the fluid that we're using, it's, it can't create a, a bubble, basically, that is smaller than the internal diameter of the pipe. Yep. And that means that fluid can't pass around mm -hmm. the bubble. Yep. So you get, you get sections of bubbles and sections of gas. You so it's like when you're, when you're sucking up the last bits through a straw yeah. and you see there's a bit of liquid and a bit of air and a bit of liquid and a bit of air. It's, it's, a, it's a succession of liquid exact, air, liquid air. Exactly that, through. yeah. And because of the fluid inside that we've designed specifically for our pipe, it means that the air and the fluid uh, can't basically mix. So they push each other along mm -hmm. in, uh, in, a, in a certain way. Well, actually, so it's not actually air, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the vapour. The so, yeah, because this is it all, um, uh, we vacuum. Yep. So it's a complete vacuum apart from the fluid itself. So what's on the screen here? What can we see? So this is the pressure and the temperature of that test cell there uh, in the free floating area. And then we have uh, a depth sensing camera as well to see the motion of the test cell. And then this is our accelerometer data. So you're just monitoring everything in real time to check yeah. what's going on. Are you changing much or are you just leaving uh, We're it? just changing the power input to the heaters uh, on the PHP. So that's just making it work and to a different level. A different OK. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right. So I'm just seeing that Liam is holding the test cell in the correct position. So here, in theory, See, that's a perfect, almost perfect parabola for us, and we're just monitoring so just, the acceleration in one direction. Keeping it, so, oh, it's just let it go. Okay, so now we're watching it yeah. drift around. Yeah. And is it doing, is it behaving itself? Yeah. It is, yes. yes. <laughs> it is behaving itself. So what's the thing about this system that is new to experiment with? Because, um, you know, people have spent a lot of time trying to move heat from one place to another. Mm -hmm. what, what's, the, it, what's the new thing here? Is it, what's the thing you are testing? So we really wanted to test to see how we could shrink it down. And because this has been tested a lot on the parabolic flights, uh, but it hasn't been tested in uh, a CubeSat size device. As well, we're also checking, there was actually a research paper done by the US Air Force, and it suggests that there was actually an acceleration produced by the oscillating motion of right. the fluid within the pipe. Yes. And we're trying to see if that's actually true or not, because it was only done on the ground. So that's potentially a problem, isn't it? Because if, you, if you've got a satellite that's in a vacuum, it, it's going to, Newton's laws say, it will continue on its trajectory unless something pushes it. Exactly. And its orientation and all those things are going to matter a lot. But if you've got something in it that's kind of making it jiggle, yep. that then causes problems. So you need, it can't be like a little animal hammering to get out. No, so no, you no, need no. it to yeah. just... We well behaved and sit there. Yeah, we don't want this to become a cooling solution. You put it in orbit and then suddenly it knocks itself out of orbit. Right. So that's the big concern, uh, which is why we're testing it on these lights. And the reason, the reason for that is that as every little slug of liquid comes round, it's, yeah. it's potentially a little push. Is that the idea? So it, even though it's a closed system, there is a potential because there is, it's, yes, the internal pipe is a closed system. You've got the fluid and within the pipe, but you're also applying heat and you're taking away heat. So it's not a fully closed system. And any of that, you could have uh, uh, increased heating on one side compared to the cooling on the other. That could uh, cause a bias in the direction that the fluid is actually moving. Mm -hmm. So it could be, and from the papers that suggested, that it was accelerating towards the cooling end. So from away from the heating end and towards the cooling end. You also have presumably a spin, right? Because if you are rotating liquid around in one direction, do you push the well, container? Well, so it's not actually moving in one direction. So the, each slug 
moves backwards and forwards uh, depending okay. on which is the pulse. Yeah. So it actually heats up uh, here and yeah. then moves up, but especially in microgravity is what they tend to do is because they don't have gravity forcing it back down, mm -hmm. it ends up one slug will probably just stay in this area of the pipe right. and just start moving backwards and forwards. So this is your first flight, how are you finding it? It's absolutely amazing. I love what your hair's doing, yeah. my hair's too well behaved. I, I straightened it especially for today. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great, um, are you finding, is it hard to concentrate up here or are you no, doing alright? It's all right? easier than I thought it would be. But then our tasks aren't very too, aren't complex at all, so... So you're just monitoring what's going on? On my side, Liam's a bit more complicated than that. He's having to, it's quite hard to keep a track of, track yeah, yeah. of that thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's really interesting being able to track Helen's flight on the screen here and see exactly where she is. Uh, we can see that the lines are following the flight path, um, so she, they're out over the sea right now. And if you look at the colours, they're also tracking the altitude. So you can see once they were up over the sea, you have these little darker blue blips along the line. And those are the parabolas that they've been doing. So you can even count how many they've done. You can see there's five on that first straight bit, then a gap where they have a little moment to reset, then another five, then they went round the corner, and then another five, and then round another corner, and then another five, and then round another corner, and then another five. So they've done five sets now. They're going round the corner again, and that's five, 10, 15, 20, 25. So I think they're on the last five parabolas. So they should be back relatively soon. The most amazing thing about being up here is how easy it is to adapt. It really shows how adaptable humans are. We're not, ignorance is bliss, we can't see what's going on just on the other side of this uh, metal wall, so we don't need to worry about it. All we're worrying about is that gravity sh changes every couple of minutes. And um, this is just normal work. You know, everyone is sitting around, they're doing the signs they would normally be doing. They get a very special opportunity to do it in zero gravity and in the hypergravity. But really, um, Humans can just get on with it. It's amazing. <laughs> this wasn't meant to be this much fun, right? <laughs> okay, that's probably enough now. <laughs> but we're going home now. That was it. Last traveller. So we're all done. Actually, in the air, one of the smoothest flights I've ever been on, which sounds a bit weird considering what we were doing. Um, and it was it's great fun. It's, it was very easy. There's a nice little routine to it. You get used to it. And actually, the thing that really stood out was the last parabola of the 31. Um, instead of being in the area with no windows, where, you know, the, everything just gets a bit heavier or lighter every now and again, um, I went back into the seats and looked out of the window drawing a parabola, and that that was worth the view. I, it's amazing how much your brain can just switch off what's really going on and that you can't, you can't avoid it when you're looking at the horizon. You can see what the plane is doing. You can feel that you're falling and it's a completely different experience. So the whole thing was great, but that last little bit when in the reality of what you're doing really comes home, that, uh, that was a definite highlight. But yeah, everyone seems very happy. Everyone's experiments worked well and Good to go. They're all now planning for tomorrow. Answer the question everyone wants to know. Oh, no one was sick. <laughs> <laughs> None of that. <laughs> It was, be was better than yesterday, but we should, um, we, we, we can go, uh, we can improve, of course, because. You've got a really good platform here. I've worked on a lot of weird scientific platforms and this is a really nice setup. So it was, it was very easy to work. And obviously your help, Melanie's help, had a big part to play in that. And so I talked to some of you, got to look at different bits of experiments, got to play with the little demos. I saw some of you were a bit envious of the little demos that I brought along. Highly recommend taking an egg timer. That was, that was fantastic. So how was it? What did you, what did you think? 
it was it was really it was really interesting it was it was very smooth actually that is my first impression and i didn't that's I didn't, not something you'd expect from no. a plane that's doing this that we were but watching on the screen think, and you know we're used to if you've been on a plane you've had turbulence it bumps about a lot and there was almost none of that a little bit on takeoff um and so because there are no windows you're also missing visual cues about what's going on outside in any case um and the thing so the whole thing was super smooth and the thing that was interesting was that even though if you glanced to the back of the plane where there were windows you could see the plane was at this kind of silly angle it felt like you were standing on the floor and and that's just because you know the resultant force was coming through the floor so are you still standing upright even though your logical brain says you are now standing at an angle like this okay um, so the way you feel it you just feel you're just different. standing on the floor i mean it's a real exercise in in relative frames of reference mm. and the fact that all you get is you get contact forces from the floor um, and that's what you're basing your idea of up on we are conditioned that gravity is what's pulling us down that wherever gravity is pulling us is down, down. and so because mm. the floor of the plane was at the same angle to down <laughs> uh, all the time it just felt like you were standing which so in retrospect is really weird feel that it was moving when it was no. turning over the so you would basically have sworn that the plane was doing something and then just oh. moving up and down. Like there was no feeling of it moving over the top. Interesting. Until you went out the back. Considering the, the ridiculousness of the concept, um, everyone was just doing their work. And again, it's that, it's that lesson in what we think is normal and what mm. we think we're doing and when we're in control. And as long as no, nothing was out of control, which it wasn't, the little humans inside the tube are just, oh, well, we're doing this, we're doing it, we're sitting there pushing this here. You know, um, there was no, there was no feeling of this is a completely weird environment. I mean, and you float for a bit, and then mm. you come back down. And so it was surprising how normal it is. I think that that the technology is good enough, and the pilots clearly are good enough, that it's so smooth you could never know mm. what it was you were doing. You could have told someone you were switching a gravity machine on, okay, and they yeah. would have believed you. Mm because there's no reason not to so that that's, so that's interesting just in terms of how what the contrast between what what we normality and what's actually going on around us what was the sensation like when you had the double g period so uh, the thing I, you, you everything is clearly squished downwards i know sometimes i was i was resting my hands on something in front and you know, if I was upright, it was kind of easier to stay perfectly upright. But if I'd leaned forward just a little bit just before, I fell forward onto my elbows, basically, okay. because of the extra force needed to keep me up. And um, you sort of feel, I felt, noticed it in my eyebrows, actually. You kind of feel your face. It's like something's pulling you down like this. Mm. Um, and that's much more, that's much harder. I think that's much harder on the body than the zero gravity, at mm. least for any p significant period of time be much harder to live like that. I mean, we talk about visiting other planets. That's only 1.8 times our own gravity. So, you know, Ooh. lunar gravity is about a sixth, I think, from memory. Mars is about a third. We're always looking at planets, the small rocky planets or moons that, are, that have less gravity. Mm. And that's easier because it's bounce, fun, you can bounce and play. But if you start thinking about bigger rocky planets, perhaps we don't have any in our solar system that match that description, but that's what it would be like. It would be like walking around in that. And it's not trivial. And on the mm. scale of the solar system, a factor of two in gravity, you know, that's nothing. That's just there. And yet, to a human body that is very precisely tuned, it must put a huge it's amount enormous of strain stress. on the joints and, and yeah. everything that's just not used to that kind of... And the thought of stepping, actually, and that was, the, so those are the points when they said, don't move your head, because mm. that's when everything is hypersensitive. But the thought of trying to walk in that, you know, you, you can imagine, and I, I sort of know the feeling, because when you're walking on a ship and you're being mm. pushed up and you feel it's suddenly harder to walk, um, and it is physically very hard, and you think it's only easy because we're used to it. <laughs> Walking is only easy because we're used to it. And you only have to turn up the gravity dial a little bit, and all our joints are going, what is this? What, what is, what's going on here? What's all that about? So, yeah, so I would highly recommend it. Anyone who gets a chance to go on one of these. <laughs> As we come to the end of this, the final episode of this six-part series, we have a small surprise for our Cosmic Shambles Patreon supporters. This series and all the projects we make at the Cosmic Shambles Network 
wouldn't be possible without the support of our Patreon subscribers. So next week, there'll be a bonus seventh episode available exclusively to our Patreon pledges. One of the experiments being flown on this campaign was looking at the behaviour of water vapour and bubbles. So obviously, keeping Helen away from finding out more about that was always going to be impossible. Head to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles to subscribe. Thank you for watching. Don't forget that you can like this video, subscribe to our channel for lots more and head to cosmicshambles.com for all sorts of different things that we do. And of course, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to ESA, to Novospas, and especially to our Patreon supporters for making this trip possible and letting us share all of this with you. 